I'm U.S. Senator Joni Ernst, and this is The Elephant in the Room. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. I'm your host, Cyrus Pearson, joined as always by my co-host, Christy Lewis. Thanks for being here, Christy. Thanks for having me, Cyrus. It is Women's History Month, March, and we are bringing you part two of our female Republican senators featured. Today's guest is U.S. Senator Joni Ernst of the great state of Iowa. Christy, top three foods you'd like to try that I was famous for? Uh, Snicker salad, I heard is one. Real Snickers candy in that? Uh, that's why I have to try it. But <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, taco pizza. Mm. Two great things combined. And this one, I just got to know, uh, sour cream raisin pie? Hmm. All right, we'll look more into that. In the meantime, here's the podcast. All right, Senator, here we have, in your free time, you enjoy ruck marching. Until yesterday, I didn't know what ruck marching <laughs> was, and then when I heard about it, I couldn't believe you enjoy it. Can you explain <laughs> what that is to us? Absolutely. Now, while I was in the service, and I, I served in the U.S. Army Reserves and the Iowa Army National Guard, it wasn't so fun when I had to do it. <laughs> yes. But now that I can just it do Stockholm it on my syndrome own. syndrome a little bit? <laughs> yes. So, ruck marching. So, in, in the military, you have a military pack and a backpack, and that's where you carry all of your belongings, your MREs, spare uniform, boots, all of that. And uh, doing it in the military, it was never that much fun, but I always enjoyed backpacking. And so now that I'm out of the service, it has become an enjoyable pastime. So I enjoyed doing it. I started uh, working towards uh, the Baton Memorial Death March, the heavy division. Uh, it is a ruck march that occurs at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. I started training for that when I was in the Senate. And how long are these? Because you're training. A, that's a marathon. It's 26.2 wow. miles. Wow, carrying, okay. So some people are <laughs> just getting through a marathon. You're going to get with this on your back. <laughs> right. So I started wow. training for that, and I had a couple people on my staff here in the United States Senate that wanted to participate. One was a, of course, he was a Marine reservist, so not a big deal for him to do it. Uh, but we started training, and there were more people in my staff that were like, hey, can we come join you and do that? And oh. So they came out oh. and started training with me, and it grew. So we've had as many as 50 people <laughs> join us on are our ruck serious? marches out on the National Mall. So is that it's called a, lot a of fun. flock of ruckers, or what do you call <laughs> it? I, I would call it that. That's a new term. Okay, <laughs> okay. we're going to call it a flock. <laughs> yeah. <Chinese> flock. <laughs> You're not scared of hard work, though. You grew up on a family farm. This was an actual farm. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, we have a lot of younger listeners, and we have a lot of listeners, I would assume, are more in the cities. Uh, it might be nice to hear what kind of things did you do on a farm? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up on a farm north of a little tiny town called Stanton in Iowa, Montgomery County, Iowa. And all of my family lived around this area. Most of my immediate family was in Montgomery County, Iowa, involved in farming. Uh, so my uh, father and mother, they lived on the farm, raised us kids. And in that farm or on that farm, we raised corn and soybeans. That's a typical crop across the state of Iowa and in the Midwest. We also had hogs. And so we had uh, pigs that we raised. And along with that came the dirty work. And I'll let the listeners look up the squeal ad. But we talk <laughs> about some of the things you have to do uh, as part of an agricultural operation. But yes, I grew up driving tractors and just working on the farm. Uh, many of us kids, we start driving very early in the Midwest mm -hmm. because we're used to driving equipment. So, yes, a lot of hard work, but I have to say... you need a driver's say, license for that? No, you don't. No, you, nope, you, nope, you sure don't. Don't. Not as a younger kid. Um, but it's great experience, and I tell you, it really does develop a great work ethic. And when you see your mom and dad working, you know, all hours of the morning, afternoon, and evening, whether it's during uh, spring planting season or harvest, you really develop that work ethic. You see your uncles and your cousins and your neighbors all engaged in these activities, and you always help one another out. And so I was ra raised 
to believe that it's your community, your family, your neighbors that help you in tough times. It wasn't the government's responsibility to step in and save you. You know, we like to take care of ourselves and we're very self-sufficient. But I, I felt that growing up on a farm and just having the wonderful family I did really helped develop me into the person I am today. Even in good times, it's tough work. Do you think that's a perspective that you bring to the United States Senate that needs to be heard? Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I do get concerned when we, you know, hear people talking about, I want a three day work week. Well, yeah, great. <laughs> okay, good on you. If you can find that job, you know, you're, you're doing quite well. Uh, but uh, I look at the way I was raised. There was not a day that my folks weren't working. And oftentimes across the Midwest, you will find that farmers or their spouses will take on uh, work even off the farm uh, to help make ends meet if they're involved in those smaller ag operations. So not only are they out there turning the wheel on the tractor and and plowing up their land or uh, planting seeds in the field, they are then driving into town and engaged in another work activity. They work all the time. And we're blessed by them because here in the United States, while we do still have food insecurity, we are much better than so many other nations because of the productivity of our farmers and ranchers. Absolutely. So you then went to Stanton High School. I guess it's okay I mentioned that by name. Yes, absolutely. Uh, And you graduated top of your class. I did. I can't relate. Christy, No, no. Okay. Well, okay. I had a class of 24. Okay. Still. <laughs> but, <laughs> still. Still counts. I give it to you. But yes, I had a great class of 12 girls, 12 boys, and I can tell you where most of those folks are today, too. Mm-hmm. Um, you then went on to Iowa State University and you joined the ROTC program. Um, you've basically, I don't want to jump ahead, so we'll, we'll, we'll go a little ahead and then come back. You've basically been in in service to the public and the nation your entire life. I mean, how old were you when you joined ROTC? I was 19. Wow. I was 19, okay. yes. What inspired you yeah. to, to serve as well? Oh, your... I will abbreviate. It is okay. a, it's a long story, but I'm going to jump into it. And, and it'll uh, you know, make sense when I tell you a little bit about why I joined the service and why the Russia invasion of Ukraine is so important to me. So when I was uh, 19 years old, in between semesters at Iowa State University, I had the opportunity to participate in an agricultural exchange in Ukraine. And so I lived on a collective farm in Ukraine with a host family. There were 18 of us from the state of Iowa, all young individuals. And we were housed in homes on this collective farm, and we helped farm on this collective. And it was very different. So the family that I lived with, they had an outhouse. I pumped, one of my chores was to pump water in the morning from the well out in their yard. Uh, They had a, a, a... couple of hogs. They had chickens. They didn't have a refrigerator. They didn't have a car. They had one bicycle they shared amongst all the family members. And then in the afternoons, we would gather as a group and we were harvesting tomatoes at that time. Everything done by hand. Uh, The farmers were still using horses and wagons in 1989. Um, But the thing that struck me is that Uh, When we got together one of those first evenings on the collective farm, there were, you know, the Iowa students that were there working, and we had the Ukrainians that were there, still part of the Soviet Union, and we got together so they could ask us questions and we could exchange ideas, and I thought, oh, gosh, they're going to ask about Iowa farming, I can talk about hogs, I can talk about, you know, row crops, and the first thing the Ukrainians asked in that forum was, what's it like to be an American? Really? And it blew me away. You know, so it just really made me think about how fortunate I was. I came from a farm where I didn't have a lot. My folks weren't wealthy farmers. Um, So, but I knew that everything I had was so much more than this family in the Soviet Union would probably ever see in their lifetime. 
Uh, they weren't able to travel freely. They had no telephone. Uh, the collective manager would, if you had to use his telephone, he had the only telephone, he would listen into your conversation and ask you who you were talking to, why. Everything was monitored. And it just struck me, they didn't have the level of freedom and opportunities we do in the United States. And so after that experience, I went back to Iowa State University in the fall, uh, rejoined that fall semester, and I just decided that, you know, I don't come from a family of wealth or privilege, so, you know, I, I can't help on that end of the spectrum, but what I can give is my service. And so I signed up for Army ROTC and and loved it even more than I, I thought I would. And a number of the, the people I was in Iowa State ROTC with, they're still my dearest friends today. Uh, but it led me into a life of service through the Army Reserves and the Iowa Army National Guard. And and uh, of just that feeling and, and um, of really giving back to the nation was really important to me after seeing how badly those Ukrainians wanted freedom. Wow. That's, uh, I, I don't even know why. This is the first time I've gotten emotional on the show <laughs> here. It's amazing. <laughs> what was your response about what it was like to be an American? Do you remember? I, you know, I can't even remember how um, any of us answered except that describing how we lived with our own families, which was so different. You know, the only thing I would say we, we really did have in, in common was that sense of community. It was a very tight community, and that's what I experienced in my hometown of Stanton. We were all very close. Um, the love of family was extremely important, but it was so different because the opportunity that I had as a young woman in the state of Iowa who didn't have parents of privilege, the fact that I had the opportunity to go to college. You know, many of these young men and women on that collective probably never did go to college. Um, I do know the young woman that I stayed with. Um, I call her, I used to call her my Soviet sister until the Soviet Union <laughs> fell apart. Now she's just my, my Ukrainian sister. But Svetlana, she did have the opportunity to study, and I'm still in touch with her today. And they are experiencing very difficult times in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I, as we can all imagine. Senator, you yourself have obviously come a long way. We are doing this during March, Women's History Month, so we are going to tie that in a little bit. You are the first female combat veteran elected to the Senate, so you yes. uh, broke a glass ceiling there. Yes, and it's it's shocking, actually, because there are uh, quite a number of uh, wonderful female veterans out there. And I try to be very supportive of women veterans that are stepping up to run for elected office. I think we bring a, an incredibly unique perspective into the United States Senate and into Congress as a whole. So you were at ROTC, and then you actually served in, Kuwait. was it? Right? Yes. Yeah, op yes. Operation Iraqi Freedom. Operation Iraqi that? Freedom, absolutely. What was that? Like you were, a, and what was your role you. Yes, I was a transportation company commander. So I was actually the first female company commander of this unit as well. And so we deployed overseas. We were permanently based in Kuwait at Camp Arif John. And my company's mission was then to pick up uh, loads of supplies, whether that was from the ports as things were coming off of the ships um, or picking up from warehouses around Kuwait. And then we would deliver supplies into southern Iraq as well. So beginning of the war, um, uh, a lot of chaos, a lot this of chaos. This sounds like the most terrifying <laughs> duty to me because, not to make light of it, but when you're in the movies and something's about to happen, it's always when they're driving down the street. So it's I would be It's always the guys in the Humvees. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, <laughs> you also were in 2003, right? Yes, I mean, so 2003. This is, this is early This on. was the beginning is, of the war, right, April kind of, of 2003. And it, again, it was chaos, and it, it was so chaotic that uh, on that first trip up into Iraq, uh, I did not have any maps. We, our company did not have any maps. Now, this is typical because I've talked to a lot of other transportation company commanders that served at that time, even active duty units, 
and they did not have maps either. So we're trying to figure out, okay, I'm supposed to go to Baghdad International Airport. Yeah. Um, well, we uh, granted, how do I get there? It's on your phone now, <laughs> so, or we had the paper, but if you don't have a map, This is you, the olden days. What did you uh, do? So, did you have to make a yes, map? Yes, so I knew um, the next camp over from us in Kuwait was a Tennessee National Guard transportation unit. And I knew that their company commander had already done a trip into Iraq. So I asked him to come over, sit down with my first sergeant and I, my squad leaders, uh, my platoon leaders and their platoon sergeants, and, you know, just explain how he ran his mission. And then we would glean information from that. So he came over. He sat down with us. He pulled out his hand-drawn map. (laughs) <laughs> and we took that and we, we copied it. But it it was um, pretty significant at that time. There were, there were a lot of convoys rolling north at that point. So at least we knew if um, something happened, there were others on the road that would eventually catch up to us or we would catch up to others. There was also a lot of air cover. There were Blackhawks and Apaches flying over our various routes all the time. So, you know, while it's a, mm, it's not entirely comfortable, at least yeah. we knew that there were other Americans in the vicinity. So something that's interesting. So you were, you were in Ukraine and, and you, you saw, you know, the USSR over there. And then you're in Kuwait uh, in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And now uh, we're seeing sort of the, the growing threat of China. You, you've been on EPW. You've, uh, you know, you're from a state that supplies ethanol. You're from an energy-rich mm-hmm, state. Mm-hmm. You're um, a, and a, an agri-rich state that supplies food to China, too. Right. So you're seeing this sort of evolution of global commodities and the importance of them in, in national security. And so how has that shaped sort of your uh, view on the, our national security apparatus and securing uh, oh, my goodness. It, it really has shaped it. And understanding that global economy and understanding that food security is national security, yeah. very, very important. Uh, now, I would say in the food space, because we are so productive across the, the Midwest and many of our other states that are agricultural states, we are able to feed our own population. Um, You mentioned the renewable fuels. Mm -hmm. America has such vast, rich resources, if only we would use those resources. But China is large in part dependent on many other nations to supply their, their food supplies. So they look to Iowa for soybeans Mm -hmm. and corn and that in turn is used as a feedstock for livestock in their nation so they have a a burgeoning growing population they have to feed them they know that Um, but recognizing that we can have a level of trade uh, that's important but I think as Americans as we see a growing threat national security threat coming from China, we have to understand that we should be producing more domestically, whether that is biofuels Mm -hmm. or whether it is petroleum supplies. I don't care. I'm an all of the above energy gal. Uh, Whatever it takes to do it efficiently, you know, inexpensively for my constituents, that's what I look at. Um, But, uh, you know, push back on China, the resources that we need for defense, what we need for pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. All of that needs to come out of China. That is a national security issue. So we have studied these issues. You mentioned EPW. We look at it in AG, the AG Committee. And most certainly, we look at it in the Armed Services Committee that I also sit on. Tied into that, uh, recently, I'd say in the last six months, it's come into the public spotlight. Should we be concerned about China buying U.S. farmland? Oh, heavens, yes. Can you Absolutely. Dig a deeper into that. You really I will. Works there, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you so. answered it very succinctly. But <laughs> for those who may not have heard about so, this, so yes, and this is one of the top questions that I get at my town hall. So I, 
I really do cover river to river in the state of Iowa, from the Mississippi to the Missouri River. I visit all of our 99 counties in Iowa. You literally go, and I li- you go to the next one, literally and you talk to everybody. Eight, okay. I've been now over eight years in the United States Senate and have visited all of those 99 counties every single year. Mm. So out there, and I hear from Iowans, I hear what's on their, their minds. And this question literally comes up at every town hall that I have. People are concerned about China and other adversaries purchasing land, especially in Iowa. Uh, Their thought would be highly productive, valuable ag land. Um, And I'll, I'll just let the listeners know that we do have in our Iowa code, we do have prohibitions on foreign entities buying land. In Iowa, there are a few other states that do, but we still see the Chinese, for example, purchasing land uh, like in North Dakota around an air base. Mm -hmm. Very, very concerning. So I'm actually working on that with the Ag Committee for a, a bill that would be included in the Farm Bill, which is to be reauthorized here in 2023, prohibiting uh, ownership, foreign ownership of land. And when I explain this to people, I'm not I'm not talking about like a, a nice Canadian couple that's coming and buying a lake house at Lake Okoboji in Iowa or something like that. I am talking about foreign entities that are buying land, valuable resources, um, whether it is ag land in Iowa, whether it's mines in Nevada, wh- whatever and wherever we have to move ahead with caution. So I'm excited to be working on that bill. Um, when my staff and I were doing the research for this project, what we discovered, if you, if you add up the number of acres that are foreign owned in the United States, the number of those acres would be larger than the state of Tennessee. Wow. In Tennessee, I think from east to west is actually longer than it is to get to Canada from uh, the it tip of it. It is a big state. big, big state. The articles that I've read who are kind of downplaying this, which are kind of downplaying this, their only argument is how small a percent it is, but that's a really I'm solid sorry. way to put it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, even just a few acres adjacent to an Air Force base, Chinese-owned. I'm sorry, I don't care how small it is. I do think that there is merit in moving forward with this. Uh, So I I hear the concerns from my Iowans. I know this is a big issue in other states. And I I don't I know folks want to downplay it, but I would rather be safe than sorry in this account. That would seem like common sense. Yeah. Well, another element of, uh, you know, national security or the country's security is our economic security. So that brings me to think Mm -hmm. of the debt and sort of what our spending looks like Mm -hmm. and responsible spending. Um, you were auditor, is that right? Yes. Um, yes. In, in Iowa, and one of, and one of the things you looked at was how to rein in runaway spending there and and be responsible. How how did that experience inform what you're able to do here in the Senate when you talk about wasteful spending and reeling it in? Yes. And my first elected position uh, was as county auditor and managing my county's books, and then from there into the state Senate, where we had to work very very hard to make sure that we were turning a budget deficit uh, into a budget surplus. And we were able to do that during my time in the state Senate. And that's important work. And paying attention to our constituents' pocketbooks like they're our own Mm -hmm. is what we should do. And so I, I look at the work that we're doing in the United States Senate, and so much of it is important but we can't continue to spend as we have. And we got caught in COVID, um, moving a number of what I believe are very important packages. And I do think it, it was the right thing to support business, you know, that, that the government was shutting down. Um, but at some point that needed to stop. But what we saw with Democrats in charge of those pocketbooks is they continued to spend like we were still in a pandemic. So... We've got to stop that. Uh, We know that we still struggle with inflation. And one of the the largest contributors to the inflation that we see today is government spending. 
federal government spending. Uh, I just I have this vision in my mind of Joe Biden leaning out one of the the upper floor windows at the White House, just throwing money out the window. And that's what people in Iowa feel like is going on. Just there must be some giant money tree, you know, over there at 1600 Pennsylvania that I'm not aware of. So we've got to stop. We've got to come back. So many of us um, do support a balanced budget amendment. But the reality is there's likely no way any Democrat would ever support. And unfortunately, I think we have, you know, maybe a few Republicans that would push back on that idea as well. But, folks, we just need to get back to uh, fiscal sanity and control our spending. Focus on what the federal government should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing. Right. And it seems like an uphill battle. Uh, and you did kind of undersell what you did. You took a $900 million deficit into a $1 billion surplus yes. in Iowa. When so if you're not going to brag Senate. about it, I Thank will. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you do try to point out with, uh, we'll bring it back to your Make Him Squeal campaign. Yes. So I, uh, again, reference the first video that was ever released in my primary in 2014. It's worth looking up if you it haven't is, seen it. <laughs> just Google it. <laughs> Make them squeal, folks. Um, so, you know, of course, growing up on, on the farm and having grandparents that went through Depression era, uh, I remember, and I know there's probably folks out there that remember their grandparents carrying around a, a little Ziploc baggie, maybe, or a sandwich baggie in their purses. My grandmas did. And if ever we had the opportunity to eat out, which was not very often, my grandmother would take all of the scraps and put them in a little baggie and put them in her purse and take them home. Um, because waste not, want not. Um, when I grew up, and I know people made fun of me after I gave the response to President Obama's State of the Union in 2015, they made fun of me because my mother had me wear bread bags over my shoes. All of us kids did out on the farm, uh, getting ready to go to school, waiting for the school bus. If it had rained, it was muddy out there. Um, we only had one pair of good shoes, so she put bread bags <laughs> over our shoes to keep them from getting muddy and dirty. So I grew up in a household of extreme thrift, <laughs> and that's what we should be doing. So my my squeal award is given every month or so, and people can go to my website, uh, my Senate website, and sign up. But we ferret out waste and abuse in the federal government, and it's not just about identifying the waste but finding ways that we can correct that problem. So not only do we have problems, but we have the solutions that go along with them. I can't believe somebody would make fun of your bread bags. That's what terrible people. Oh, I know. And our governor, Kim Reynolds, she is an amazing governor, dear friend of mine. She wore bread bags, too. She wore wonder bread bags. And I, I, I kind of make fun of her because she had designer bread bags. <laughs> <laughs> I had generic. So. <laughs> oh, let's touch on a couple more issues while we still have some time. Um, the Iowa uh, caucuses were were the first in the nation, and uh, that's changing. Do you have any uh, views on that? I assume you don't like it. It is a changing landscape, yeah. and no, I don't like it. So Republicans are continuing with the right. Iowa first in the nation caucus. Uh, that's great. I am so thankful for that. But we see that Democrats have peeled off and have decided that they would much rather uh, be surrounded by coastal liberal elites. And so they are really focusing on these first-in-the-nation states that are all along our coastlines. And they've left middle America behind. And the argument is, oh, well, we need more diverse populations. I don't know that it's about a div diversity when it comes to race and and gender, but diversity of thought. And in Iowa, I'm, I'm going to give some kudos here to the Iowa Democrats when they were involved in caucuses, because those are the Democrats that gave President Obama his start in mm -hmm. Iowa, okay. our first African-American president, and Pete Buttigieg, uh, who is an openly gay secretary in this administration. Uh, they gave him kudos. He finished first in the Democratic caucus. So it, to me, is more about diversity of thought, not necessarily about the color of your skin, but, but really about the content and your character. 
and I may have this completely wrong, but uh, if Iowa does uh, go ahead and hold an election first, then the Democrats will withhold the delegates having any power at the convention? Yes, I, I assume that that is what would happen, and that's not healthy. That's not healthy for Iowa Democrats, and I'm, I'm very upset that they didn't fight harder. I mean, they just basically rolled over and let President Biden tell them what to do and how they were going to uh, run the caucuses slash primaries. And I think it really did a disservice not only to the Iowa Democratic Party, but to Iowa as a whole. Um, So, again, I'm so proud of our Republicans and the fact that we maintain the first in the nation caucus state. But darn those Democrats. They're regretting it now. Hmm. And maybe more to come on this. Yes. Uh, And let's also talk about your work as the ranking member on the Small Business Committee, which means you hold the highest position in your party. Uh, Ninety-eight percent of Iowa's economy is made up of small businesses. Yes, that's that interesting. Is there must be a lot of accountability uh, locally. Yes, there is. So many small businesses and uh, just hard workers, entrepreneurs, and a large part of that will also be our family farms. If you think about it, like my dad, he was a small businessman as a farmer. Uh, He and my mother managed the books for the operation, and uh, he also then peeled off and had his own uh, construction company, uh, heavy equipment, earth moving. Uh, So there is uh, the uh, can-do attitude again because we're not in urban settings. You don't easily have this business or that business that you can just call up and say, hey, can you do this? Sometimes you have to make your own business. And those small businesses really do start to thrive in areas where uh, someone has seen a need and fills that gap. Um, So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to serve as the ranking member and focus on our rural communities and ways that we can benefit, whether it's women-owned small businesses, veteran-owned small businesses, just small businesses in general, because they make up such an incredible part of our economy. Running short on time. Anything else, Christy? So I noticed the other day um, you were you led a delegation down to I think it was the ports of entry at um, in San Diego and Mexico City. Um, you've you've been a, one of the leading voices talking about combating fentanyl. You'd written an op-ed about how this has contributed to overdose deaths in Iowa. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what you're seeing with this uh, you know fentanyl crisis and what you're focusing on for for solutions and trying to talk about. Yes, absolutely, Christy. So, you know, I I love the fact that we get to go to the border and we see operations at the border. I've been to the Texas border several times, um, but this was a unique opportunity. It was, a, of course, we had all, all Republicans that went to San Diego to the port of entry there. It is the busiest port of it, the busiest land port of entry anywhere in the world. Mm. So there are 70,000 vehicles that go through this port of entry every single day and 20,000 pedestrians every single day. And it's described as the epicenter of where fentanyl enters into our country. There are 34 traffic lanes continuously backed up at this port of entry. And yet what I noticed, one of the main screening tools that they have for fentanyl, other drug-related paraphernalia coming into the country, are dogs, working dogs, canines, that sniff those drugs. On any given shift, again, 34 lanes of traffic, any given shift, they have three to five dogs. Wow. Wow. Three to five dogs, that's it. You know, if we had more of those dogs working those lanes, um, maybe we could continue to move vehicles quickly through those lanes. But I tell you what, we'd be hitting on a lot more cars that had fentanyl in them. So if they hit on a car that is suspected of having drugs, it's sent to a secondary screening area. Um, And then other than that, we have some ideas uh, that we're working on with various committees of jurisdiction. But having a joint task force. This was very successful. We have what's called Jayadif South, which is Southcom. It's a joint task force that was established to combat cocaine coming out of Colombia, large in part that's been very successful. 
we need the same type of operation located in Mexico with our DEA, our ATF, with our FBI, with intelligence organizations, but in conjunction with the Mexican authorities so that we can combat the cartels and the fentanyl that's coming into the United States and poisoning every one of our communities. Chris, it always shocks me how intelligent the senators that we get here are because they don't have sheets of paper they're reading this off right. of. They don't know what we're asking. And then it's just such an in-depth knowledge of these things. Very impressive, Senator. Well, thanks. We get to spend a lot of time <laughs> with wonderful subject matter experts and some of the best constituents in the world. Can I end this on a lighter note? Yes, please. I, I think I might know some <laughs> trivia about you. Many people may not. Oh, boy. You are a fan of ninjas? Oh, my gosh. I am a fan of ninjas. <laughs> now knowing more about you, I have no idea how that happened. I, <laughs> Do you well, even you know, know I, I don't know what I can, you know, they're, I don't know what I can say. They're sneaky little son of a guns. <laughs> um, you know, so, no, I, I just love it. I think it's, it's so funny you bring that up. But we joke about that behind the scenes, folks, all the time about ninjas. We... And... <laughs> We heard that, and so I cut out some clip art one day when she was coming up to film a video, and I taped it to the camera, and she took a couple I of them. I took them. And we went down, I don't I know if it was six them. months or a year later yes. to your office. They were there on her mirror, still taped up, and that literally made my month. It was, it was the best thing I saw, so I want to thank you for that well, so much. Well, thank you, and thanks for doing that. And for the folks that are listening, we're in this great studio, um, wonderful Republican conference studio, and they have a green screen uh, uh -huh. in the other room, and I've always <laughs> joked about ninjas. Why don't More I have ninjas, ninjas you know, ninjas. in my green screen? And they actually had... <laughs> One time when I showed up, they played, they put ninjas on the green screen. Your wish is our <laughs> command. Senator, too fun. Too fun. Uh, thank you for all the time. Mm, thank you, thank guys. you. Congratulations on how far you've come. Thank you for serving this country. And uh, thank you for being today's The Elephant in the Room. It is an honor and privilege. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to be notified when more of our interviews come out, Please hit the heart plus sign or thumbs up button. You can use your ninja stars or your nunchucks if you'd like. The Elephant in the Room is brought to you under the direction of U.S. Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming. Our behind-the-scenes team includes Arjun Modi, Carly Rapp, and Elena Seiler. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back soon with another The Elephant in the Room. Elephant in the Room.